Hello, 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 NCLEX Crusaders. How are you? Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to NCLEX Crusade International. And this is another training for Pass the NCLEX step by step. And today we will talk about the assessment versus implementation strategy. So have you ever seen a question that when you're analyzing the questions, you see the answers, you see a mixture of assessment answers and implementation answers. So what is the priority? Is it an assessment? Is it an implementation? When is the assessment a correct answer or when is an implementation a correct answer? So we will discuss several questions today where you will have the opportunity to improve your critical thinking and you will be one step closer to passing your NCLEX. It's been quite a few weeks since I did my last training. Remember, we did a seven day training. If you have not seen that training yet, make sure you find it here on our YouTube channel. It says, pass the NCLEX step by step, seven day training. More than seven hours of wonderful information that will drastically help you pass your NCLEX. I want to make sure that everyone can hear me. So if you can hear me, go ahead and comment on the section, what city, what state, what country you are connecting from. Last time I checked, we had more than 40 countries connecting here in our YouTube channel. And please go ahead and like that video, like this video, subscribe to our channel and make sure that you are sharing this content with other nurses out there so they can be blessed as well. So looking at the chat to see if you can hear me, if you can listen to me. See you people from Austin, Texas. Very good. Tampa, Florida. Welcome Tampa, Florida, Orlando, Florida. Welcome Orlando, Philadelphia. A lot of people from Texas, Miami, New York, Canada. Welcome, Canada. More from Florida, New Jersey, North Carolina. Excellent. Any other countries other than the U.S. and Canada out there? Ghana. Welcome, Ghana. Nigeria. Excellent. California, Maryland, New York. All right, well, welcome everyone to today's training on the assessment versus implementation strategy. So this training is going to be a little bit different than what you guys experienced in our seven day training that we did several weeks ago. Today, we're going to go straight for questions. So this is what I will be doing every week. I'm not going to promise that I'll be here every week, but I'll try. I'll try the best I can, but sometimes I get too overwhelmed with all the classes and the academy. But I will try to be here at least once a week, giving some training, practicing some questions together, and I will create a new playlist where I'm going to be putting all the sessions that we will be doing here live on YouTube. This is completely free for all those students around the world that cannot afford to pay a mentor. And if you want to use me as a mentor, if you want to learn from me, I am more than glad and blessed to help you prepare, to help you understand the NCLEX world. And of course, the biggest thing that I will help you do is improve your critical thinking and you will really learn how to identify important keywords on an NCLEX question. That way, when you're taking your exam, you can take your critical thinking with you, which I tell you is what it will make the difference between passing or failing the NCLEX. Welcome to NCLEX Crusade International. My name is Professor Rainier uh, right so let's go with the first question. And what I want you to do, I want you to read the question, try to identify what you think 
are keywords within this question. And of course, once you're ready to select your answer, go ahead and place your answer in the comment section. But I want you to do something else. Not only put the comment, but I want you to explain why. So in other words, you're going to put your answer, comma, and this is the reason why. That way I can see how you're thinking and I can provide some feedback. Okay. Thank you for everyone that has decided to support our YouTube channel. I will not uh, mention everyone because I know there's many of you, but from the bottom of our heart, I appreciate anybody taking the time and donating or supporting our YouTube channel. You don't have to do it, but if you feel it from the bottom of your heart to help us out, go ahead and do it. I am grateful for that. So let's begin with this question. It states, which action should the nurse implement for the client with a hemothorax who has a right-sided chest tube with vigorous, vigorous bubbling in the suction control chamber? So there are some important keywords here and there is something extremely important that I can see in this question and I know many of you are making this mistake. So if you're not concentrated, this is the time to put all your senses here and listen to what I have to say. If you notice on the question, it states, which action should the nurse implement for the client? I will highlight this in red, which action should the nurse implement just because a question states which action should the nurse implement first does not necessarily mean that the answer will be an implementation because a frequent mistake that I see nurses make is they see in the stem of the question it says nurse to implement and they think well if i see an assessment answer i will eliminate that answer and this is incorrect i will show you in this example that this is completely wrong do not make that assumption so what is the patient's problem hemothorax and the patient has a chest tube and there is something going on, vigorous bubbling in the suction control chamber. So you have to think, if I see bubbling, is that okay? Or is that a problem? Well, the answer is, it depends. It depends on where the bubbling is located or found. Bubbling in the suction control chamber is okay, but there is an explanation of the type of bubbling. There is an adjective here that describes the bubbling and it says vigorous, vigorous bubbling. And we are supposed to see gentle bubbling in the suction control chamber. So let's use the critical thinking. There are two answers that if we really take a close look at it, they are implementation answers. And there are two assessment type of answer. Answer number one, check the amount of wall suction being applied. So in answer number one, the nurse is doing an assessment of the amount of suction on the wall suction. So answer number one is an assessment, not an implementation, because the word to check, by checking something, the nurse will get information. Now, answer number two. Well, that's very easy to identify because it says, assess the tubing for any blood clots. So answer number two is 
and assessment. Answer number three, strip the tubing proximal to distal. This is an implementation. And answer number four, it says, encourage the client to cough forcefully. This is another implementation. So as you can see, you have a mixture of assessment and implementation answers. So what is the correct answer? Well, answer number three and answer number four, we can eliminate. This is the reason why. Stripping the tubing is contraindicated. This is an action that was done many years ago, but evidence-based practice has determined that stripping the tube will cause damage, would cause problems to the patient. It will create a negative air pressure, and this is gonna cause problems to the patient. So answer number three is eliminated. Answer number four, it says, encourage the client to cough forcibly. So if the patient is coughing with force, do you think that is the appropriate action? But most important, is it going to help you identify why the vigorous bubbling? Is it going to help with the vigorous bubbling? The answer is no. So answer number four is eliminated. We have a problem now, right? We are left with two assessment answer, but as I stated at the beginning of the question, the question stated, which action should the nurse implement? And we have eliminated the implementation answers because the word for the nurse to implement means an action that the nurse will do. So you have to learn this and do not make that mistake to assume that the answer is going to be an implementation. Now, out of the two assessment answers, what is my priority? What I will be doing next? Checking the amount of wall suction being applied or assessing the tubing for any blood clots. Well, I will tell you this. Assessing the tubing for blood clots will be more pertinent if we see that there is no tidaling or fluctuation in the water seal chamber. So it does not make sense to assess the tubing for blood clots because that is not going to cause the vigorous bubbling. So answer number two is eliminated. The correct answer is answer number one. Now, the question is why? Why is answer number one the correct answer? Why am I checking the amount of wall suction being applied? Because if the wall suction is too high, that is going to cause the vigorous bubbling in the suction control chamber. This is the least invasive action that the nurse can complete, that the nurse can do. And it will identify if that high suction is what's causing the vigorous bubbling. So the correct answer is number one. Now, I would like to use this opportunity and talk a little bit about bubbling because you can see questions on the NCLEX that has to do with bubbling. And you need to know when is bubbling okay and when is bubbling not okay. I already mentioned that bubbling in the suction control chamber is expected. It does not indicate a problem. But remember, you are supposed to see gentle, not vigorous. When we see vigorous 
bubbling, it usually indicates that the suction is too high. Now, remember, it doesn't really matter how high the suction is because this, um, this equipment is, it was created in a way that even if the suction is too high, is not going to cause damage to the patient's lung. So that is important to know. Now, listen to this. If you see bubbling in the water seal chamber, okay, in the air leak monitor, if you see bubbling there, it usually indicates that there is a leak. It usually indicates an air leak. Now, there is an exception to this rule, and you have to know this. In patients with known pneumothorax, you can see intermittent bubbling in the water seal chamber, and that is expected in pneumothorax. So you have to learn this. Well, I hope you've liked this question. I tried to include a little bit of content there because I know that chest tubes and all these questions about the suction control chamber, the water seal chamber, the collection chamber, there are a lot of questions on the NCLEX about this topic. So I hope that you answer this question correctly. All right, let me see if I see your answers. All right, excellent. I see somebody saying, I didn't know that a wall suction was used. Well, it's telling you in the question that there is vigorous bubbling in the suction control chamber. So that is telling you that suction is being used in this question, okay? Okay, Brent, professor, amazing, thank you. A tricky question? Yes, I, I think it's a tricky question, but guess what? Are you going to see tricky questions on the anklet? Yes, you will. And you will see questions even more difficult than this question that you are seeing right now. All right, Stephanie, great. I think you got it. All right, perfect. So question that I see. Professor, I see that the answer is to check the equipment. Shouldn't we check the patient first? Isn't the patient more important than the equipment? Absolutely. But there are no answers that directly assesses the patient for complication. Because the only answer that addresses the patient specifically is answer number four, and that does not make sense because it's not pertaining to the stem of the question. This is important. All right. I'm just reviewing uh, some of your answers. Never strip the tubing. This is correct. Okay, perfect. Professor, is this video going to be available later on after the live? Yes, it will be available after the live on our YouTube channel. All right, let's go to another question that is very, very interesting. This is the question, and I will tell you some important words that you have to identify on this question, okay? Okie dokie, I see. It says, a nurse provides care to a three-year-old client who presents to the ER with a high fever, sore, red throat, and drooling. Which of the following nursing 
intervention is the priority. As you can see, this is a priority question. We have a patient that is three years old and the patient is in the ER and these are the clinical manifestations that they are providing for us on the stem of the question. It says high fever, that's important, sore throat, and drooling. And the question you need to ask is a three-year-old, a normal three-year-old supposed to be drooling? Is that expected at that age? Or is that something that is not normal? What about the fever? What is the relationship between three years old, high fever, sore throat, and drooling? What medical condition are you thinking is going on on this question? And once you have determined that, what do you think is the priority? So... Answer number one, it says, assess oral temperature immediately. Answer number two, assess for the presence of stridor. Answer number three, assess oxygen saturation. And answer number four, position the client in the supine position. Once again, what do we have? We have three answers that are assessment and we have one answer that is implementation. So we have a mixture of assessment and implementation answers. So you have to think, what is my priority? Am I going to assess first or am I going to implement? And also, I see something in answer number four that is very important and makes you think of another strategy. Answer number four says, position the client in the supine position. Anytime you see in an answer a position that you're changing the patient into, remember this. Is this a correct position change? What am I trying to do? Am I trying to promote something? Am I trying to prevent something? So if you have a patient that has high fever, sore red throat, and drooling, and I change the position to supine position, is that going to help the patient? Yes or no? Is it going to help me prevent something? Now, this position change will harm my patient. This scenario that they are providing to us indicates a possible epiglottitis. It is not diagnosed yet, but the clinical manifestations that they are providing on the stem of the question indicates a possible epiglottitis. And putting the patient in supine position will harm the patient the patient will develop further respiratory problems if I put my patient in the supine position. So answer number four is eliminated. Now, if you look at this scenario, this looks like an emergency. And in scenarios where you have an emergency, usually the correct answer is an implementation because you have to do something that helps the patient's problem. However, in this scenario, the only implementation that we have doesn't do anything for the problem. It does not help my patient's problem. So therefore, I don't really have an implementation left. Now, all I have left is three assessment answers. Now, out of the three assessment answers, what is the correct one? Can we use the process of elimination? Is there any answer that I can eliminate? Yes. Answer number one, you can eliminate. Why? 
why am I going to eliminate answer number one? Because it says, assess for oral temperature. Assessing oral temperature in a patient with a possible epiglottitis is contraindicated. Why? Why is it contraindicated? Because attempting to see, to take the temperature, attempting to visualize the posterior pharynx, obtaining a culture, a throat culture, or anything like that, will cause spasms of the epiglottis, and this is going to cause more problems. So we have already two answers that are eliminated. Answer number one and answer number four. All right, now we can breathe a little bit better. We have two answers left. Answer number two and answer number three. So what am I going to do first? Am I going to assess for the presence of stridor or am I going to assess the oxygen saturation? What do you think? Let me see on the chat. Who thinks the answer is to assess for the presence of stridor? So type two on the comment section if you think that's the answer. And type three if you think oxygen saturation is the correct answer. So I see... Gabi and Gustavo 2, Nodira 3, Oxygen. So as you can see, there is a mixture in between all of you guys. The 394 nursing students that are connected to this live training right now, you're probably there in between 2 and 4. I know that you probably eliminated one very easy and you probably eliminated four very easy using nursing knowledge because by using nursing knowledge, you know that oral temperature is contraindicated in epiglottitis and you know that placing the patient in supine position is contraindicated in epiglottitis. And now you have answer two and three and you don't really know what the answer is. And you know what? Both of you are correct because answer number two and answer number three are correct answers. I need to assess for the presence of stridor and I need to assess for the oxygen saturation. I have to do both. But what is the priority? What is the most important answer well i'll give you i'll give you two reasons why two is the correct answer not three but i want you to understand this ladies and gentlemen listen to me very carefully selecting answer number two i'm not saying that answer three is incorrect Answer three is correct, but it's not the priority. The, ans the reason why it's not the priority is the most important thing. Because that is the NCLEX for you right there. This is what makes prioritization questions so difficult. That it doesn't matter how great with nursing content you are, that if you don't develop a technique on how to learn how to prioritize, you will answer incorrect questions or answers very frequent. The answer is two primarily because of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. When I talk about stridor, stridor needs or deals with airway, talks about airway, and airway has the priority over breathing and circulation. Oxygenation or O2 saturation, we are going to categorize it as breathing. 
Because do you agree that you could have low saturation and it could be related to exchange and not airway problem? There may be not an obstruction of the airway, but an exchange problem. What is going on on epiglottitis? We have an airway obstruction. This is an emergency. So selecting answer number two is first the priority because of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Stridor and airway is the same thing, but also it helps you validate the patient's condition because if you see there is no diagnosis on this question. It doesn't say on this question, a nurse provides care to a three-year-old with epiglottitis. It says, a nurse is providing care to a three-year-old who presents to the ER with XYZ symptoms. So this is important to learn and identify these tips. All right, so answer number two, is the correct answer. So tell me, are you learning? Are you enjoying this live training? Remember, ladies and gentlemen, remember nurses, on these questions, I take a little bit longer time because I am trying to explain it to you guys. I'm trying to make an emphasis on certain words because you might think, well, professor, I don't have 30 minutes on the NCLEX to, to identify or to analyze questions. Remember, I'm teaching now, so I'm doing it slower. I'm putting emphasis on certain words. I'm trying to teach you critical thinking. So it will take me more time, but I can analyze these two questions in three minutes, in less than three minutes, without a problem. And so will you, once you develop that critical thinking, and once you start using prioritization strategies, this is important. I want you to know this. I don't want you to get discouraged because you might think, oh, it's taking me too long. It's not going to take you too long once you practice, okay? Uh, Il uh, Ileana, for sure, I'm learning a lot. Thank you, all of you guys who's uh, supporting the channel. I appreciate it. I haven't taking time to, to mention each one of you because I want to focus mainly on the, on the live training that I have prepared, but thank you. Thank you for supporting the channel. Excellent. All right. So a little bit more about epiglottitis. So let's talk a little bit about uh, epiglottitis, the bacterial form of croup. Basically, the patient manifests with inflammation of the epiglottis. That, that is what epiglottitis means. Usually or frequently caused by the Haemophilus influenzae type B or Streptococcus pneumoniae. The H range that usually we see uh, epiglottitis is in children between 2 and 8. This is why the age description on the question that says a three-year-old is important to, to identify that epiglottitis. The clinical manifestations in epiglottitis, we see high fever, okay? We got that check mark, high fever, sore, red, inflamed throat, check, we got that, pain, that is not described in the stem of the question. And we have difficulty swallowing. And although it doesn't say difficulty swallowing, the description of drooling is very similar to that. So definitely this clinical manifestation described in this scenario indicates a possible epiglottitis. The position that usually these patients adopt is known as the tripod position. Basically, the patient leans forward, trying to catch their breath. That's why putting this patient in supine position will do a lot of harm. Okay? 
So supine position is incorrect for this patient. All right, so we have another question that I want to practice with you guys today. We are not done yet. We're gonna practice another question, continue to improve your critical thinking, but anybody that is listening to this live training now, if you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, go ahead and do it now. Click the subscribe button. The reason why is you don't want to miss any of our videos or any of our live training. Well, only if you like it. If you don't like it, you don't need to subscribe. You can find another YouTube channel. Maybe you find somewhere else to, to learn with a style that matches your need. But if you like it, if you enjoy the way I teach, if you enjoy the way I disclose these questions and think critically about this question, go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That way you don't miss any information. And another thing, very, very important. I see that we have about 434 current live viewers at this moment, and there are only 228 likes. Please, I ask you, help me out, help my channel grow, because that's gonna help help other people out there. So if you don't mind, hit that like button, make sure you click it so this channel continues to grow, is the way to help me out. I am helping all of you guys out here, taking time out of my day to create this training for you and provide some valuable information. And the only thing that I ask in return is for you to subscribe, like, and of course, share this information with other people that other nurses out there that they are somehow preparing for the NCLEX or will be taking the NCLEX soon. Thank you, thank you for doing that. We have created a Telegram group for nurses who want to join our live classes, okay? Starting this Saturday, we will begin our first live Zoom class for our English community. We have a Spanish academy for more than four years and we teach every day in that academy. I don't have a lot of time left out of my busy schedule, but I have created at least one day out of the week where I will be doing live Zoom classes for those students who want a mentor. So if you want to know more information about this Telegram group, we have already 481 members uh, subscribed to this Telegram group. I will ask my advisor to share on the comment section the link for this a Zoom practice live telegram group. So only join that group if you are interested in getting more information about live classes. If you're not interested in um, joining the live Zoom classes, do not join to this group and join to this one. This is the free telegram, free YouTube training telegram where I post videos, links for our YouTube lives. So if you want to join the free international YouTube training telegram group, I will also ask my advisor to put that link on the comment section. Okay. So right there, you see uh, NCLEX Crusade advisor. That is the uh, link for the telegram live soon. So remember, only click on that one if you want to join the Zoom live classes. If you want to join the YouTube training only or receive video training, then join the other group. There's more than 2,800 members on that Telegram group already. All right. Well, let's practice one more question. Let's do one more, one more question before we uh, complete this YouTube live training. All right, here's the next question. A client has been diagnosed with a UTI, a urinary tract infection, and is experiencing acute pain and discomfort. 
what should the nurse implement first? So we have a patient with a diagnosis. The question before didn't have a diagnosis. Now we do. Now we have a UTI and the patient is experiencing right now. So we have an actual problem. The problem right now is acute pain and discomfort. This word acute is important because acute pain versus chronic pain is different. There is a different priority order when the pain is acute or when it's chronic expected. What should the nurse implement first? Once again, we see this word implement. Do not assume the answer is an implementation. One, give pain medication as per doctor's order. This is an implementation. Encourage the client to increase oral intake of fluids implementation. Number three, call the doctor. Implementation. And number four, assess the level of pain using a pain scale. So this is the assessment answer. So what do you think is the correct answer? Are you going to complete? Are you going to do an assessment? Are you going to do an implementation? What is the priority? Well, let's see. This is the tip. This is the best tip that I can teach you today. Okay. This is an excellent strategy that you can use. Whenever you see a mixture of assessment and implementation answers, think about this. When you look at the stem of the question, has the nurse conducted an assessment? Yes or no. And another question that you need to ask is, is it an emergency? So if we ask these questions, we look at the stem of the problem that we have in front of us and there is not a whole lot of information. The only thing we have is information referred by the patient. Because the patient is experiencing acute pain and discomfort. Now, is there any indication that the nurse has conducted an assessment or do we have objectable data? Do we have measurable data? I know the patient is in pain. I know that the patient is, the pain is acute. And I know that the patient has discomfort, but what is the level of pain? Is it one? Is it five? Is it nine? Is it 10? What type of pain is it? Is it sharp? Where does the pain radiate to? What makes the pain worse? What makes the pain better? or improve, we have no information. The other question is, is it an emergency? Are they are describing this question as an emergency? No. So in scenarios where the stem of the question is lacking valuable information, Whenever you feel like you're lost, you don't really have a whole lot of information. The nurse has not conducted a, an assessment and you do not see an emergency. Usually the answer is an assessment. So if we follow that strategy, the only assessment answer is answer number four. So therefore, Using this strategy four should be the correct answer. Okay. Uh, guys, I see as uh, a, somebody uh, putting in the comment section, hot girls, boys, please, you know, don't do that. 
I know that that's probably a robot or a scammer or something. So my support team, if we can, if we can block these people, um, I take that very seriously. That that kind of disrespect. I don't, I don't, I don't feel very comfortable with it. So please, um, our advisor, uh, Brani, if we can do something to block that person and eliminate, okay? Because it kind of gets me distracted. So. I continue. So do not click on that because that's probably going to take you to s some kind of like pornographic content or something like that. And uh, I apologize for that. I don't, I don't know why YouTube allows this, this kind of things to happen, but oh, well, we'll continue. Okay. So once you see or use this strategy, you will know that in these scenarios where no assessment has been conducted, there is no measurable information and it doesn't look like an emergency. The answer is probably an assessment. Now, I don't want you to think or make an assumption that is always like that. Assessment is not always the answer. Do not make that mistake because implementation can also be an answer, especially in scenarios where you have an emergency. So by using this strategy, the answer number four will be the correct answer. But now let's take it a step further. Does it make sense? Let's think of maybe another strategy that we can use to eliminate another answer. For example, answer number three says, call the doctor. And a lot of nurses like to select that answer, the calling the doctor answer. Remember this, if there is something that you can do, if there is something that you can do that helps the patient's problem, do it before you call the doctor. So by using that, we can eliminate answer number three. So we have answer one, two, and four left. And we are already thinking we're kind of inclined to answer number four. Let's look at answer number two. Encourage the client to increase the oral intake of fluids. Is that going to directly alleviate the pain? How do we know what is causing the pain? Where is the pain exactly? We don't have a whole lot of information of how the pain is happening. So giving fluids doesn't really make sense in this scenario. So answer number two, we can eliminate. Now we have answer one and four. Give the medication following the doctor's order or assess the level of pain. Well, how do you know the medication that you will be giving if you don't know the level of pain? Because there are pain medication for mild pain. There are pain medications for moderate type of pain. There are medications for severe type of pain. Since you don't know the type of pain this patient has, Giving the pain medication is not the priority answer. You have to identify the level of pain using a pain scale to get a measurable data. So patient, what is your level of pain? Oh, nine. Oh, that is a severe pain. I know what to do now. Or, well, no, my patient is two. Well, that's a mild pain. Then I know what medication to give following doctor's order. So answer number one is eliminate. All right, guys, thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting our YouTube channel. I hope you have enjoyed this YouTube live for those students that will be tomorrow live on our Zoom class. We will continue learning about the assessment versus implementation strategy. 
you will see many scenarios where we will be using this strategy. You're going to learn about some rules of exceptions, scenarios where implementation is the right answer. Scenarios where the assessment versus implementation strategy does not apply. So continue following our channel. Thank you very much. God bless you all. Bye-bye.